Hello and welcome to The Thought Room. I'm your host, Hallie Rose. This week I'm recording this intro from the mountains in Whistler, British Columbia, where I've come for a weekend of a little ski trip with a couple of my closest friends. It has been so incredibly wonderful just to hunker down in this little cabin Airbnb that we've got and it's ski in and ski out and I've just been taking some time after all of my travels in Costa Rica and my time spent at Soltara Healing Center to recenter and refocus And it's been a really interesting time for me personally. There's a lot coming up in the wake of my time there, just in reflecting and coming into this year. So I have been a little bit quieter than usual, I think, on social media and just really honoring the impulse to go inward and really be with the emotion and the challenge that's coming up. The reason I like to share this is because sometimes the image that one can get from somebody's social media presents one thing and in reality, what's going on within their inner world is quite different. And one of the commitments that I've made personally is to be as transparent as I possibly can be with the true nature of what's going on in my life. So part of that is to tell you exactly what's going on in my process. And it's been so wonderful to and freeing to really just say, hey, I'm having a hard time right now and to reach out to friends and to connect and to share and to challenge myself to look inward at why and feel grateful for the opportunity to allow my feelings to really come up and we spend so much time curating different versions of ourselves and we live in a world where where yeah sometimes we need to protect ourselves and and there are appropriate times to really express your feelings and other times when you have to kind of hold it all together and so it's so lovely to be in a safe place with beautiful wonderful supportive friends and to just really let everything come up so i'm certainly feeling raw and vulnerable and I'm in it my friends and I am so happy to share this episode with you this week because I really think that it is also very raw and very vulnerable. This week's episode is with former UK Special Forces soldier Ollie Allerton. Ollie has extensive experience in various international missions. He is also one of the star hosts of an army style reality TV show called SAS, Who Dares Wins. And he's the founder of a company called Breakpoint. I can't wait for you to hear this episode because Ali is such an incredible storyteller. We begin recording and we pretty much jump right into it. I mean, within the first 10 minutes of this podcast, Ollie dives into this absolutely edge of your seat story about his childhood and being mauled by a chimpanzee at 10 years old. And like I said, in the first 10 minutes, he's saying something like, I looked in his teeth and I saw blood and I realized it was my blood and I don't want to give it all away, but this one heats up pretty quick. So from the story of the chimpanzee to wild stories of being in the special forces and a story about being on a special team in Iraq that was escorting members of ABC News and their team was actually ambushed and and Ali describes the terror of these unmarked vehicles coming up behind them and 
AK-47s coming out of the windows, pointed at his face two feet away and having to react in the immensity of a moment like that. Later, he talks about being involved in breaking up a child prostitution and slavery ring in Thailand and tracking spies. I mean, this guy has has done everything. And yet he brings such a, a groundedness and an impeccable viewpoint of being a military veteran and what that means and coping with his trauma around that. So this episode was recorded at Soltara Healing Center in Costa Rica as part of the Soltara series. As you know, uh, we have a special offer for anyone who is considering a retreat at Soltara. So if you've been following these stories and you've been thinking about Soltara as a place you might like to visit to do some self-exploration of your own, the link for that is soltara.com. Co. So S O L T A R A dot C O slash thought room. And if you use the code thought room at the checkout, you'll get $200 off your plant medicine retreat at Soltara. So, speaking of plant medicine, Ali and I get to dive into his plant medicine experiences at Soltara. And he describes, you know, at the time of this recording, some incredible insights about his girlfriend, Laura, who I'm happy to report as of now is his fiance and uh, how much new perspective he'd gained on their relationship. So I don't want to give it all away, but this is definitely one of the most rich storytelling podcast episodes we've yet released. And lastly, I want to point you toward Ali's books. He is the author of two books. One is called Breakpoint, which I've linked in the show notes, and the other is scheduled for release in April 2020. It's called Battle Ready, How to Take Control and Transform Your Life. So without further ado, let's step into the thought room with Ali Allerton. Ali Allerton, welcome to the Thought Room. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Haley. So we are currently at Soltara Healing Center, mm. and you are here this week as a guest. Is that correct? I am, yeah. yeah. Yes. And um, I was I was really moved to talk to you, actually, after the group share that we had as a group on Wednesday and you shared some stories that were profoundly insightful. And I think at this point I have a knack for recognizing a good storyteller <laughs> and you certainly are that. Yeah. Part of what I love doing or what I love doing with this podcast is not doing too much research on people before they show up sure. because I really just love to meet the person in front mm. of me. So that being said, I want to welcome you into this space and wherever it feels natural for you to begin telling us about why you're here and how you got here. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for this opportunity to have a chat with you. So um, where do I start? Um, I've got a an interesting story, really. I know a lot of people have got interesting stories, but um, mine really began at the age of 10. Um, and it was a boiling hot day. And it was our summer holidays. I was at home doing nothing. And there was a knock at the door. 
And we went to the door and in comes uh, mine and my brother's best friend, or my, more my brother's best friend called James. And he comes through the door and says, um, guys, shall we go swimming? Let's go swimming. And my mum straight away was, was happy to get us off her hands and said, yeah, yeah, go on, go on, boys, go down to the swimming pools. So we got our stuff together and we went down to the pools and we've, um, this is in a place called Staffordshire, which is sort of central um, UK, United Kingdom. And we got down to the bridge that crossed the river um, and we saw it straight away. It was the, it was the big top setting up in town. And our, our, our sort of walk turned into a quick pace, into a, into a jog. We were so excited to get to the circus, you know, the swimming went out the window. And we got down to the big top, you know, out of breath. And we saw the first guy there and said, look, can we have a look around? And he said, yeah, boys, we're just setting up. So, uh, you know, all the animals are on change. Just, just go for it. And um, so we went, went into the big top and there were certain animals in there. There was, you know, an elephant. There was some small monkeys and just general bits and bobs, you know, that you'd expect in a circus. And I kind of got separated at that point from my brother and his mate. And I was drawn towards the uh, another sort of exit stroke entrance into the big top, which was on the opposite side. And I could see something in the haze of the, the, the sunshine. I could see something. So I was drawn to it. And I, as I got to the door, the, the sun hit me straight in the eyes. And, you know, I was kind of sun blinded for a second. But once that haze cleared, I saw in the middle of this open expanse, this middle, this green area was a monkey, a, a baby chimpanzee. Now, for me, I, I love, I grew up with Tarzan. I love Tarzan and, um, you know, Tarzan and Cheetah. And for me, you know, I was brought up, this is, this is England, you know, with domestic dogs and cats, that's about as good as you get. So for me to see this chimp there was, was like a slice of Hollywood. You know, that was my slice of Hollywood right there. And I was drawn towards the chimp. Um, and before I knew it, I stood above the chimp and I was looking down at the chimp and it was looking down at the floor and it, it just suddenly lifted its head and it stared at me and it had these beautiful brown eyes and it sounds weird but we connected it was this it was a surreal moment you know this 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 beautiful eyes we connected and it was like a moment i'll never forget and then it looked down to the floor and it picked up a piece of fruit and it passed it to me and um i straight away thought jesus i'm not going to eat that it's disgusting you know, mm. so I, I went through the motions though. I thought I'm not going to, you know, this is, uh, I'm going to be courteous. And so I started throwing it over my shoulder and I was going through the, and I was, it was just a surreal moment. Just, just absolutely beautiful. And, um, it probably lasted seconds, but you know, it, it felt like a lifetime to me and it was so peaceful, but then the peace was then broken, almost like a fighter jet cutting through the sky as I heard this roar and I looked well, it immediately got my attention. I looked in the background. I could see this um, shadowed area underneath some trucks. Something was moving and further noises. And, um, and the shadows then clearly turned into what was a 50 kilogram thereabouts. I, I didn't get a chance to weigh it, but it was, it was big. Um, it, was, it was the mother of this chimp. Um, and the chimp started making its way towards me it was it was fierce it was growling it was just going mental you know it was wanted to protect its own and at the moment i thought yep yeah, i can get away from this i can run away um it pounced and it, it jumped almost, it must have, it seemed like 20 20 foot through the air over the other chimp and the sky the beautiful blue sky turned into blackness as this chimp landed on top of me and pinned me to the floor and it was absolutely ferocious. It was just, you know, it had one intention and that was to absolutely kill me and protect its own. Um, and this thing was going wild on top of me. You know, it's like a drummer in a rock band with its arms coming down, beating on my chest. It was, you know, it's, it was bot trying to bite my face, trying to, just trying to, trying to kill me, I suppose. And um, I, it got to the point, and again, this is something that would happen really quickly, but it seemed like forever. And I can remember looking up at this chimp and I could see some, well, not so much my flesh, but I could see like blood dripping from its teeth. And I realized it wasn't the chimp's blood, it was my blood. And I realized that I had to do something, otherwise I was going to die. But in order to do something, I had to anger that chimp further. You know, it would, it would anger, it would up the ante. Um, but that's the choice I had to make. And it was the only chance of survival that day. 
So I managed to dislodge the chimp so it fell onto the floor. Um, and it gave me just a couple of inches to pull my knee up to my chest. And then I managed to smash the, as it came back towards me, I managed to smash the chimp with my foot in its chest and it hit the floor again. And that gave me a few feet to scurry away. Um, and at that point it tried to get back to me and it was just, just before it got to me, it was caught by the chain. Um, and this monkey, you know, I stood there, 10 year old boy, and it was just, I was just a mess, an absolute mess. You know, I was, I was dripping with blood. Um, and I was just in absolute shock. The whole place erupted. And um, this lady came, I can remember this lady got to me first and she's, oh, Jesus, we need, to get, we need to get you looked at. You know, and there was bites all over my arm and blood everywhere. You couldn't really make out what was, what the damage was. And then she put a hand on my arm and as she turned it over, she could see all my arm was ripped out. And it was a, it was a, it was a real mess. So um, I went to hospital, and um, they did a real bad job of it. You know, they tried to because there was a massive piece missing. They tried to sort of put a stitch in here, there, and everywhere, then pull it all together. And it was, it was just they should have done a skin graft or something. I don't know, something different. But um, so it was a real mess. Um, so that was a real traumatic experience for me. But that is something that we will that will unfold during this podcast this this talk um because that chip chimp never stopped giving all the way through my life up until this point today um you know shortly after that we we then went over to we used to go to uh, the south of france every year for a couple of weeks and we went to the south of france for a couple of weeks probably a week after that incident and my arm was in a bag you know i couldn't go in the water you know this thing was trying to mend um and I can always remember my father was in, we had this, one of those big static um, sort of caravans and uh, my father was pacing up and down. He couldn't find what was, what was wrong with the, you know, there was a smell in this, in, in the caravan and he's putting bleach down the sink. He's changing the bins. He couldn't find it. And then he stops next to me and he goes, undo that bandage. And mm. well, he actually undid it. So he took probably a, a few turns off. And there it was, it was, it was sodden with green mm. and that was gangrene. Um, so I was immediately thrown into a car and rushed to Saint-Tropez um, and I was then taken into a doctor's surgery and I was then put on um, the, the bed, this sort of doctor's bed and my father had his knee in my chest and the doctor had my arm extended out and he had to get a, a, a scrubbing brush with ethanol to scrub out all the disease in my arm. And it was, it was, it was actually, that was actually worse than the chimp. The pain was actually horrendous. I, you know, I just screamed the place down. It was, it was another shocking experience for me. When that happened, you know, I came out of that in total shock of, of that experience as well. And then we were, for some strange reason, we were taken into this other room and it was a really palatial. It had paintings, you know, sort of um, paintings on the ceiling. There was very well-dressed people in there. And my father was introduced to this lady. He was very stunning looking, blonde hair, uh, French. And my father was kissing her cheek to cheek. And I had no idea what was going on. And um, we then left. We went down the stairs and we got to the street outside and I looked up at my father thinking, you know, I'm going to get some love off this man that's helped with this torture. <laughs> and uh, he looked down at me and he said, son, I, I can't believe this. I've just met Brigitte Bardot. And Brigitte Bardot, for those that don't know, is the, the famous French actress. And for me, I, I didn't have a clue who Brigitte Bardot was. It was just such a weird experience for me. Um, and my father was elated, you know, it's like, um, so that was that, and that, that's, that was where that experience at that point was really locked away. You know, it's, it's as we do when we, you know, trauma with trauma, the problem or what we tend to do, what I did is I locked it away and forgot about it and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that moment, that incident changed who I was. It really changed the dynamic of who I was. And from that point on, it gave me a different outlook on life. I was just, you know, for good and predominantly at that point for, for, for bad reasons, for not good reasons. And it set me on a trail of destruction from 10 years old, not so much at 10, but as I was getting into my 
later years of sort of 13, 12, 13, I was chasing danger. Like you wouldn't believe I was pushing limits. I had no, I was void of consequence. Um, and I got in a lot of trouble with the police that caused a lot of pain to my family, um, a great deal of pain. Um, and through that time, my mother and father then split up. Um, my father left, which at that time for me, you know, I was, I was just a rebel. My father was quite a Victorian kind of disciplinary father. And for him to leave was, was just perfect for me. And, you know, that's for me when the, when the gloves were really off and I went, I went wild. Um, and that's another story in itself. And, and I won't delve too much into that today, but, um, you know, from that point I, I got into, like I said, I got into trouble with the police. My mum was, um, um, so supportive and I'll never forget my mum for that because she was going through such emotional trauma with my father leaving. She, she had three kids, a big house and no support from my father financial or anything like that. And, um, you know, at that point I'll never forget that, you know, and this is what I see as sort of, uh, true, true sort of love is the fact that through all that trauma she had, um, you know, she, she, her, her selfless love was for me. And she, she then put her hand down for me and she showed me the way and, and she channeled all that energy and direction into sport and, and, you know, cross country running and athletics and et cetera, et cetera, and really got me back on track. And I'll never forget that. And, um, uh, and that's really sort of led me on to, to joining the Royal Marines, you know, at 14 years old, I was adamant that I was going to join the Royal Marines, which is the UK military which for 14, you know, is quite profound to actually know what you're going to do. My, my son's 18 and he doesn't know what he's going to do yet. Um, you know, so I was, I was there, I was set, you know, for me, it was the military, it was the Royal Marines, which I then joined. And, um, and after 32 weeks of basic training from 18 years old, I, I passed the, the course. Um, and I was very proud to be a Royal Marine. You know, I've got everything that I wanted. I did my first tour in Northern Ireland, which was was quite a, a, an experience for me. It made me grow up a hell of a lot. You know, it's it was my first sort of introduction to war. Um, and and then after we came back from that, we then got called to go to Operation Desert Storm, which was in Iraq. Um, again, you know, it's that was everything I I should have wanted. Um, you know, for me, I was still that crazy, wild teenager um, that wanted to chase death. It was, it was, an, it was an unhealthy habit, <laughs> and um, you know, it, it just for me, I wanted to fight every day. I wanted to be at war every day. You know, I wanted to be on the front line. And um, I got back from Iraq, and it, um, it kind of went into, you know. Not, not the normality of, of being a soldier, which isn't all about fighting wars. It's being, you know, back home. It's it's going through training, exercises, all that kind of, and I found it so boring. And it wasn't enough for me. It just wasn't enough. And I was going to leave. And um, uh, I went to see my brother pass out. He joined uh, the Navy. He passed as a pilot. And it, I saw my officer there from... from um, from when I was in Iraq in Desert Storm. And I told him, look, I'm going to leave. It's not for me. And he said, look, uh, you know, I saw something in you and it's such a shame if you leave um, because I believe you've got what it takes to join the Special Forces. Um, and for me, those words were something that were etched in my mind from that point, you know, but more so the point that he said, if you don't do it, you'll regret that for the rest of your life. And that, that echoed through, you know, I couldn't sleep that night. I thought about it the next day and before I knew it, you know, I'd, I was um, I was nominating myself to go on special forces selection. Got recommended to do so, and um, and there I was yeah, I was uh, one of three hundred and fifty that started that um, selection process. Six months later, I was one of five that passed as a twenty four year old. There is a lot of stories in the middle of all that, but you know, that's um, I think uh, this could be the longest podcast ever if we go down <laughs> that route. You'd be surprised. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, but uh, but again, for me, you know, I then joined the special forces. I joined my team, and it was just like to be that one, that small percentage of someone that you know. This is something that if my officer hadn't given me that confidence to do, take that first step on that first day, I'd have never have done that because I just didn't believe that I had the, the I didn't have belief in myself to to, to be able to do uh, or pass that course. Um, but even after joining the special forces, you know, it wasn't um, again. It wasn't enough. It really wasn't enough, and I just couldn't figure that out. Um, you know, I should have been happy. This is the best, this is a boy's dream. 
you know, and I was there. I had I was I had all the toys in the world that you can ever imagine, and as you know, as a young boy would ever dream of. And it just something it didn't connect for me. Um, so from that point, I um, I eventually left in two thousand the special forces and did some work in in um, in and around the UK, um, and then went to um, if everyone remembers the statue falling in Ferdos Square in Baghdad, which uh, which was the Saddam Hussein statue, and it was apparently the the end of the war. It was the liberation of Iraq, and it 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 was clearly not that. It was really the start of the war. Um, but you know, I went out there as a contractor, um, and there's a long story. Do you, do you want me to delve into this? Because there is some power in what I say here, and I, I really think it's important for me to get this across. Because um, you know, I, I I went out to Iraq, and initially I was working for ABC News. I was their protection team. Uh, I was a team leader, I had a six-man team out there, and basically we would go to areas where um, they would want to do a news story. We would have to make sure that we did all the security checks. You know, if, if something went wrong, we were there just to provide that safe umbrella around them and then get them to safety, et cetera, et cetera. Now, because the statue came down in Ferdos Square, um, it was this perceived or this perception of a low level of security. They thought the war was over. And obviously, as we know, it wasn't. Now, security, they, you know, we were expensive, really expensive. And any company, um, security doesn't create revenue for a company. It's a cost. So anytime they can downsize, they'll do that. Now, for me, i have given up everything to, to go out to Iraq, as everyone else had done. So the thought of me losing that contract was just too much to, to even comprehend. Um, and one day I got called up to the ABC Bureau Chief's office to, to, to look at a job um, that I had to do, or we had to do over the next couple of days. And that was to, to bring in the new ABC Bureau Chief from Jordan. And I then asked what the job would entail. And, you know, it's, we've got to pick 12 people up. We've got to bring them to Baghdad and blah, blah, blah. Now, I then my next question was, how many people can I take? Thinking that I would take pretty much the whole of the team near enough. And I was told that I could take one other. Now, that you don't need to be a military tactician to understand that that's the wrong ratio. You know, it, it's, you, you would have 12 people looking after two. But, you know, Anything I said would not change that dynamic. You know, that was what I had and that's what I had to deal with. And, you know, I didn't want to upset the status quo. But one thing I did want to do is I wanted to meet the new ABC bureau chief coming in because I knew his top line job was to downsize and assess the need for security. So I wanted to be the man that met him to see if I could convince him otherwise. All that day on the way to, to, to Jordan, it was a long, long drive. It's like 14 hours in a soft, you know, I was in a soft skin vehicle. That means bullets come through. It's not armored. Um, and all that way on that drive, um, I had a long time to think. And I'd thought about how I could change things in my life, how I've managed to change the dynamic of things in my life to suit the outcome that I want. And how have I done that? You know, special forces selection, joining the Royal Marines in the first place, you know, a, a whole list of events. And there was always, uh, there was one underlying theme and that was a positive frame of mind. And I always visualized with massive amounts of creativity, the outcome I wanted. It was always about, it wasn't about the journey. You can't, you can't affect the journey, because, uh, but you can visualize on the outcome that you want. And I would lose myself in that. So anyway, I'm sat there thinking all the way to, to Jordan and um, I had number two with me. Um, and we get to the Intercontinental Hotel in Jordan and we sat there at the bar. The, the, the client's not coming in till the next day. And um, I, said to, I said to my number two at the bar, we had a beer. And I said, you know what needs to happen tomorrow? And he says, what? And I says, we need to get attacked. And he looked at me like I was crazy, as you would. And I laughed as well. And I said, no, if we get attacked tomorrow, we get these guys out of that. That is going to... Um, that's going to keep the contract. We're going to keep the contract. That will justify our value and justify our need. And that's what needs to happen. And then I went into very specific detail about everything I've been thinking about. And I've mentioned, you know, tomorrow we're going to get here. We're going to go to the border. It was always traumatic across the border. 
we're then going to um, get to a place called uh, between Fallujah and Ramadi, which was always, it was still a hot spot at that time. It was a crazy hot spot that you, you had to avoid. We're going to get there. We're going to be attacked at speed. We're going to be ambushed. And I went into so much detail. You know, I talked about the bullets going down and, and as the bullets are going down, I can smell the cordite from the bullets. I'm using all my senses, all my senses. Like I can smell the cordite. I can, you know, touch every, every sense I was engaging through this story. Um, and then we're going to get these guys out of that. We're then going to get them to Baghdad. And they said, we're going to get back to Baghdad to the compound. The compound will open and there'll be a hero's welcome for us. And then we will sign the contract. We'll get given a glass of champagne, the bubbles. I felt them go down my throat. I went through the experience in my head. I felt the bubbles tingle down my throat. And that was that. And we talked and we had another beer and we, he, we had, I sort of got him into the flow of this creative story. Yeah, what was he thinking? Was he well, just... Well, he just thought it was a joke. Uh, you know, I mean, I wasn't actually... Were you actually, freaking him out with that? I mean, was he yeah. like, I hope that doesn't happen? Well, of course, but really, I didn't really expect it to happen. Mm. I didn't really realize that, that the power of positive and intent and visualization actually worked. I just knew that I wanted to pass my SAS course and I visualized at the end. So that's what I did. So I, I shaped that into this. Um, so anyway, the next morning, three o'clock, the alarm goes off and there we meet our, our, our team and there's 12 of them and there's, there's four vehicles. We're in the last vehicle. There's, there's four in each of the vehicles in front. And um, we make our way to the border. As predicted, it's absolutely traumatic. Um, and as soon as we got to the border, you know, it's like they were getting everything out of the vehicle. And it was just unbelievable when you're looking at what was going on because these guys from New York, you know, they were there with Louis Vuitton suitcases, uh, dressed head to toe in Gucci, Rolex watches on. And if I, if I didn't think that was bad enough, I looked over and then I saw them just getting all their equipment out, out which included about $100,000 blocks um, in cellophane wrapping and um, putting this stuff on the pavement. I was just thinking, oh my God, this is not good. And all, all eyes are on, all eyes are on. Anyway, we managed to pack up. It, it probably took us a couple of hours to get through that. And then we, we went just across the border. We went to what's known as, we call it a cache, cache you call it. It's basically a hole in the ground where we used to dig in the weapons. I got my weapons out and get the weapon to the guy behind. And then we cracked on, you know, and um, I wasn't really thinking about anything all that journey. I wasn't thinking about anything at all about just getting back. I was so tired. It was a boiling hot day. It's, you know, and this is another 12, 14 hour journey. And we were swapping over the driving. And then it um, got to the point where we probably t 10 hours in. And I can remember at one point my head was hitting the wheel. And um, I thought, Jesus, I need to, I need to snap out of this. This is dangerous. So I said to, my, to, to the guy in the back, you know, um, I said, you know, when we get back, we're going to have a debrief. I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to sleep for 12 hours. I'm absolutely so tired. And he said, yeah, yeah, me too. And as I did that, I passed a sign that said Fallujah. I can remember seeing the sign and it caught my eye to the left. And as I looked to the left, I also saw something else. And that in the rear view mirror, there was a flicker of light. And it caught my attention straight away. And I said to him, look, there's something coming up from behind. There wasn't anything on the highway really at that time of night. It was about 1700 hours. And um, something was getting closer and closer. And it was clearly flashing lights. And as it got close, we, we then identified another vehicle, a backup vehicle behind that one. And my mind was racing, just thinking I was just... Um, negating what it possibly could be and just verbalizing what I wanted it to be. And I was like, that. look, it's the Americans. If it's not the Americans, it's a, another security company. And um, as it got closer and closer, I realized it wasn't the Americans because it, was it was a Mercedes, a black Mercedes, all blacked out windows. And then I thought, yeah, okay, it's just another security company. You know, they want to they wanna, um, just pull over and, and get past us. They're, they're in a rush. But we were doing about 130 k's an hour anyway. We were going really fast. Um, and then every kind of hope of what I what I wanted it to be at that moment in time just diminished. As all the windows came down and AK-47s came out from every window. And I absolutely was in a state of panic. You know, when I was in the Special Forces, I could call in an airstrike. I could call in naval gunfire from miles away, but at this point I was so alone. You know, I had my number two, but I had the responsibility of the people in front. Um, they had invested on, in me 
to save their life, you know, to, 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 um, keep them safe. And, um, I was just, I was going into a flat spin and I can always remember, you know, I was just in that, this moment of, it was a feeling of total confusion. And it was, it was at the point, you know, where it almost felt like I was going to freeze, but, and which isn't a good idea when you're driving a car. Um, but I was snapped out of it straight away by the sound of AK-47 fire where they started opening up. And the bullets were starting to come over the top of the car, you know, with warning shots initially. And if you've heard an AK-47, a single one is intimidating. But when you've heard four of them all together, it's like an orchestra from hell. Um, and at that point, I realized I had to do something. Um, they were hard against the back bumper of the vehicle and they were beeping, flashing the, flashing the lights. And, but the, like I say, the gunfire snapped me out of that. It took me back to my training and it made me switch on in a heartbeat. You know, I had to do something at that point and that was I had to triage that situation. I had to let go of the responsibility of the 12 people in front. I had to let go of all the mind chatter, all the confusion that was going on. I had to focus at one, on one to two things that really did matter. And that was the threat. Um, I get the order to the guy in the back to stand by and I basically, we were hard against the, uh, uh, the central reservation and I then, um, very quickly pulled the vehicle into the center lane, allowed the vehicle to come up. Um, and then I closed up to the vehicle in front. So essentially I boxed them in and, uh, you know, stupidly they fell for the trap. Um, and I can always remember, I looked down, I've been in some fights before but never like this. And it was, I looked down at this guy and I've never looked the enemy in the eye. And to me, you know, you could see the Arab headdress, you could just see the eyes and his AK-47. I looked at him and again, it was a moment that seemed to last forever and it didn't, you know, it was, it was seconds. And he, our eyes connected. I could tell he just looked like a young boy and I didn't want to do what I was going to have to do, but his AK-47 was falling onto my head um, as it was the guys in the back. And at that moment, I gave the order to open fire um, and popped up. Um, I popped up my weapon onto my arm and blasted through the, the closed window into the vehicle, um, which for me it was, you know, it's, it's what I had to do. I, di I didn't want to have to do that, but I had, I had a job to do. I had to, the people in front, I had to save their lives from that situation. And I can remember after that point, their car sort of veered into the central reservation. The backup car went to that one. And then, you know, I got straight on the comms and I was like, we've been in a contact, you know, we're, we're on our way back. No casualties, our side, unconfirmed, unconfirmed kills on the other side. Um, ETA 1.5 hours. And then from that moment on, you know, there was, there was so much anxiety because we didn't know if we were going to get followed up. Um, you know, the incident that just happened was just a total shock and this total ringing in my ear you know that you do get after a contact but the one thing that was blowing my mind is everything that i had said the day before timings locations the smell of the cordite from the bullets in the air i'd just been through it was like i'd been there before and it was freaking me out and i was just thinking oh my god what what just happened an exact carbon copy of what had asked to happen um, at that point, I got back to um, the compound, the doors opened, and then that, what I saw in front of me freaked me out even more. It was a hero's welcome. The car pulled up, I can always remember, and I was sort of still in a, a state of confusion. I opened the door, I heard all this sort of almost like change falling on the floor, and I looked down, and it was glass falling out of the vehicle and all the empty shell cases from the rounds. And as I looked up, there was someone there with a glass of champagne. I took the champagne, I tasted it, and I felt the bubbles go down my throat and my mate was looking at me like you are a witch <laughs> <laughs> we're you know when you do something like that you know that you are scrutinized heavily especially for an organization like abc news about were your actions valid um so we didn't know what was ahead of us but we were called then up to the abc bureau chief's office and um both of them were, were there at that time the oncoming and outgoing abc bureau chief and um we got commended for our actions and he saw the whole thing. He was in the vehicle in front. And very shortly after that, he slid a piece of paper, paper across the desk and we signed the contract for another two years. And the reason I tell that story, it's not for the glorif glorification of the actions that I took. And, you know, I'm still, I still deal with what I had to do at that moment. Um, but 
what that changed my life forever. And that was a moment where I realized the power of visualization and the power of positive thought. It works. And it was almost like me, when I look back at that, it was almost like the universe wanted to, me to understand that this stuff works so much that they were prepared to, to make, you know, put me into such a situation where I nearly lost my life through that positive thought and visualization to prove a point. I know that sounds quite bizarre to some people, but for me, that's what it was. And that for me, it was an epiphany. And from that moment on, everything I've done from that moment has been focused around that same scenario, you know, the positive thought, the, the visualization, everything. And I just understand that, you know, our mind is so, so powerful that, um, you know, we have to be so careful with our thoughts, you know, and so many people, we all, as far as I'm concerned, this is my opinion, and uh, I've got plenty of people that agree with me, but we all have an amazing gift, all of us. But the thing is, if unless you ha know how to use that gift, people are using it in a, in a negative way and they're getting negative outcomes, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, but we all have that gift. It's not some people just have the gift. Everyone has that gift. Um, and, uh, you know, I, all I want is for people to be aware of that gift that they've got and start changing their mindset around, you know, the, the things they think about and the outcomes that they want in life. So for me, from that, you know, Iraq after that, you know, I was struggling at that time massively. I wouldn't say struggling, but after that attack, I didn't think how I was going to come back from Iraq. Um, it was just, you know, the, the lack of support we had uh, and everything else. I, I adopted a, um, a new friend, which was alcohol on a regular basis. You know, whenever I wasn't working, I couldn't deal with the chatter that was going on in my head. Um, and I was drinking heavily, so I was numbing myself out. Um, and then as well at that point, not, not long after that, I was, um, I got an addiction with Valium. Um, I was in this alpha male world, so I was also taking steroids and the whole combination cocktail of that is just mayhem. So regardless of the fact that I still have this sort of positive mindset, that was the only thing that managed to pull me out of those really terrible situations. If it wasn't for that positive mindset, I think it'd be a different story today, even if I was here. Um, I eventually left Iraq um, in two, uh, 2006, 2007. Um, it was just getting too much, the mental strain, the attacks. Um, we lost a few friends. Um, and then I tried to get some kind of normality. I moved to Australia with my girlfriend. She was Australian. And, um, you know, I tried to get some normality in my life. I started selling some real estate and this, that, and the other, a normal job. And for me, it didn't work. It was just, it wasn't enough for me. I needed more. I still had that stream running through me from that, you know, as a child from the chimp attack, I still wanted that danger. Um, and something struck my attention at that point, And that was um, something that was, um, I wanted to be part of. And that was an organization called the Gray Man. And the Gray Man was set up by a former SAS commando from Australia. And it was basically helping kids escape child slavery and, uh, child slavery and prostitution. Uh, so I immediately, I, I joined that team and, and I found myself shortly after that over in Thailand. Um, and we were busting kids out of child prostitution and slavery. Um, uh, gangs, you know, we, we, we were um, basically releasing them from the um, the cartels, uh, and that was that for me was the most amazing thing ever. I stumbled across something there that I never knew the power of, and that was the fact that you know we the basically there's satellite camps all the way across Thailand between the border of Burma and Thailand, and 1.6 million kids a year are sold into slavery and prostitution, sex slavery and, and, and all kinds of stuff. So, um, which is phenomenal. You know, I never got a hug from my dad. I moan about that as a kid. These, these kids are sold by their parents into this, um, into that world, knowing the kind of things that can happen to them. It's, you know, it's shocking. And for me, I wanted to be an effect on, on, on changing that, trying to change that. Um, and we had a pretty, good um good run as well 
um, we were basically, you know, the, the cartels would come up to the camps, they would recruit them, they would then leave, and then shortly afterwards they would be taken down to the brothels, fishing villages, and et cetera, et cetera. So we had to get in there, and between that time process them, they were then taken to an orphanage, and then we had donations coming in that would pay for their um, schooling, et cetera, et cetera, give them a normal life. Um, now, the, something happened there which was such a shame because... Our organization was so proud of what we'd done. We had a real um, a real good run and a bust. There was 22 kids. It doesn't sound like a lot in the 1.6 million, but it was in the whole scheme of things. And they, unfortunately, while we were still in country, they put it in the, in the media. It went all over the world, which was great initially, but then the US State Department got hold of that. And um, they got hold of the Thai government and said, look, we pay you millions of dollars every year to prevent this from going on you do nothing and we're reading the paper here there's a four-man team gone in and done more than you've ever done what's going on uh they immediately retaliated and and basically said look there's no problem as such going on here this organization you're talking about is totally bogus they're just taking donations and putting it in their own pockets you know i'd actually spent all my money from iraq to self-fund this you know so it's from my pocket um but what that meant for us is there was a manhunt then for us. You know, they, we were then chased out of Thailand. We had to escape across the Burmese border. Um, and I eventually made it back to um, back to Australia. And the whole thing had to be closed down, which for me was hideous because I'd invested everything into this. But one thing it left me with, which was so powerful, and that is how... The wealth in helping other people not as fortunate as you, or not just as not as fortunate. You know, when you help someone else, I think we've lost the power to do that. You know, everyone's so sort of wrapped in their own silos nowadays that everyone's, you know, um, sort of, they want the most, uh, you know, Instagram followers. They want, you know, they, everyone is so competitive that we've lost the power to help each other. And the power and therapy in that is just amazing. So for me, the special, you know, the Royal Marines didn't do it, the special forces I couldn't connect, which was bizarre for me, but doing this, it connected. And it was like the most humbling thing I'd ever done. So it left me with some real powerful tools, I guess, to, 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 to go into the world. And that's, at that point, um, you know, I'd, I'd lost everything at that point. Um, which was a crazy period after that, but I finally got myself on track, got myself a job, a decent job, kept myself in one piece, and it was, you know, a normal job. And again, you know, I, I was working in oil and gas, and it was just so mundane. But all that time I was thinking, how, how, I, could, how I could use this experience and this newfound um, sort of power to help others. Um, how could I use that? So that was really where the concept of my company came up, which is Breakpoint. Um, and that my mission statement for that company is to create a globally identified brand recognized for the positive growth and development of others. And that was really the, that was the heart. That was sort of my heartbeat from that moment on, you know, I had this dream about, you know, I visualized again, I, I visualized about creating that company, how I could help other people and feeling that that was so much therapy for me. That was the best therapy in the world when you can help other people and change the dynamic of their lives to a more positive and productive one. And certainly one that, saves kids from prostitution and slavery absolutely did me so much good um and i then came back to the uk which i said i'd never do um in 2014 with this dream of starting that company um and i kind of sort of did a bit of work around london i was i was chasing some spies around russian spies around london it was quite bizarre um but i was getting wrapped back into that world and I thought, you know, if I if I lose myself in this, earning decent money, etc., I'm going to lose the passion for my dream. Uh, you get so busy earning a living and get lost in the the you know uh, everything that entails with that. Um, so I, I cut away from that. And um, at that point, I, I again, I had you know I, I had nothing. And but what I did have have is that that those experiences that gave me the toolbox to be able to then put into practice what I needed to do. I locked myself in a house for two months back in England. Um, luckily, my brother had moved away to Malaysia to, to work for Shell as a helicopter pilot, and there was a spare house, which was quite convenient. And I sat in that house for two months. I couldn't get any money from anywhere because I had no credit rating in the UK. And 
so I couldn't get loans for my business and et cetera, et cetera. So I reverted to my experience in Baghdad, you know, the visualization, the power of positive thought. And I thought, I am going for this. And I did everything, you know, every morning affirmations. I put in, did a contract to myself. Um, I meditated. I, I just, I didn't watch TV. I didn't, I still don't really watch TV or buy newspapers, but I didn't engage with the outside world as such. And it was a boot camp. It was a mental mindset boot camp to create the dream. And that happened, that kind of lasted for two months. And I was there, you know, into that two month period. And I had my family sort of, you know, my family saying to me, come on, this isn't working. You know, you need to get out there. I was 43 years old. You need to get out there and, um, and get yourself a job. And I was like, no, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing that. This is my dream. And, you know, I had hardly any money in the bank. And uh, at that point where I started to doubt myself, you know, through other people that doubted what I was doing, et cetera, et cetera, you know, I started to let that seed of doubt enter, which is dangerous. Um, and at that point, I got a phone call from my best mate um, who, you know, I shared that dream with, who said, look, you know what we're talking about doing with Breakpoint, do you want to do a similar thing on TV? And at first I thought he was drunk. I thought he was in the pub and I just thought, Oh my God, everything I'd done, you know, I'd done it so intensely, you know, I'd visualized being on a stage talking to people and I'd visualized doing these different separate events with my mate who would phone me up, you know, and, and how we could spread the story and how we could help other people, you know, be, break those limitations in their life. And, um, you know, I'd, I'd done that so intensely that it delivered to me something massive. And that was the best stage ever. And that was TV. And that for me was just phenomenal. It's just like a dream country. It was a gift from the gods and it cha everything changed in that. From that phone call, spoke to the production company and that was it. It was created, you know, and, and that for me, it wasn't about being a TV star. It wasn't about being a celebrity, which I still struggle with the, with the whole term. Um, but for me, it was the platform. It was the platform to start my own business. Um, and with the, first show in 2015 um we launched and from there it's just been amazing you know we've now done five shows we've gone we did the first one in the uk we did the second one in um in ecuador we did the third one in morocco we did the fourth one in chile and we've just done the fifth one in scotland um, and the show, the concept of the show, for those that obviously don't know it, is the fact we we take people, 30 civilians with with minimal to no military training, we put them through the hardest sort of selection process, similar to what we went through when we did the SAS selection in the military. And we're looking for the mental attributes of a special forces soldier in a very short period of time. Uh, and it's it's extremely popular. It's definitely very popular in the UK, and it's it's now got global sort of recognition. We're we're going over to Australia now to start filming um, for the Austra for Australian TV. But for me, again, you know that show is the backbone of creating my dream. And Breakpoint has come from strength to strength. You know, we've got so many people that have done our programs, mindset programs, um, our courses. We do sort of courses where we. We, it's not the it's not the kind of things that we put them through, you know, which is sort of military based. It's the state of mind we put them in, and basically we put them in unfamiliar circumstances that are alien to them, um, and we allow them to see what basically happens when you get put into a to um, into that area of discomfort. Your thoughts, actions, reactions, and emotions become organic you know, the ego is gone and you don't get the ability to be able to design the perfect outcome as we do in a comfort zone. So what happens then your, your character becomes raw and you actually see your character for the first time. So the decisions you make, the actions you take, the thoughts you have are raw for the first time in so long, because we get programmed as kids, you know, you go through your schooling, they're basically programming you for society. And, um, and, and it's the first time that you actually see that character for so long. And for some people, that's a hard pill to swallow, but it's a life-changing one. Um, so that's really the, the concept of Breakpoint. It's the stepping into the short-term discomfort for a long-term gain. And, you know, with alcohol and drugs and et cetera, et cetera, they're the opposite of that. You know, people are stepping into a short-term discomfort for long-term discomfort, you know, and, and really any kind of growth is stepping, as we know, is stepping into that discomfort. 
you know, you have to go through that to find, um, to get the growth. Um, so yeah, that's really led me to where I am today. And, um, you know, over that time I have heard a lot, a lot of talks about ayahuasca, um, never really understood how it could help and benefit. And then I think it's just through the power of social media that, you know, has switched me on to, to, um, how that can help people, how it is helping people to great effect. And also for me, my, um, girlfriend that from Australia, she was a psychologist, which was greatly helpful at the time for me. Um, but she's the one that's switched me onto this because she's doing a lot of studies into DMT for veterans. Um, so, and she went off to spirit quest in, um, in Peru recently. And she just said, you need to, you need to go and understand what this is all about. So really she's the one that sort of fed me in the direction and I was going to go that way. And it's, you know what it's like, you put the energy out there and, and you get what you, you're looking for. And, um, for me, you know, I, I didn't have to overtly kind of start looking for where I needed to go all of a sudden. Jesse from Heroic, Heroic Hearts Project got in touch with me. I, I saw his stuff on Instagram. I, I liked his page. I liked a couple of his posts. And he said, look, I'm over in London. Do you want to meet up? And that was the start of that. You know, I met Jesse and I sat down in the, uh, the cafe with him. And just the words he said, it just made my hair tingle. It was like, look, we've got a retreat um, happening in, in December. Would you like to come? And I just thought, oh, my God, you know, it's... I don't, I don't say that stuff is weird anymore. You know, I was at, at the point where I used to go, wow, that's weird. It's not weird. You know, the, the opportunities are all out there. You've got to line yourself up. You know, as people think oh, I've got to line up the opportunities, you don't need to, you need to line yourself up with the opportunities because they're, they're there already. So for me, that was just amazing that, um, you know, I had this opportunity and not only just to, to go as an individual, but join some other veterans. And also he said, you know, have you got another veteran that you'd like to, to bring with you? Which was amazing because I knew straight away, I had one guy that um, works with us at Breakpoint that I know had been through a fair bit of trauma and was still going through it. And, um, and um, yeah, he was the perfect person to bring. And um, that's why we're here today. Wow. <laughs> wow, what an incredible trajectory mm. yeah. an intense intense path for sure yeah. Yeah. and um it's it's been really unique this week i mentioned this before but having a group with so many military veterans we've got so we've got some from the uk some from the us and some from canada and the dynamic of the group as i was mentioning is very reverent, very focused on, on healing this week. And it's always, I mean, the groups are always focused on their healing, but there's a, a thread of inner quiet and introspection that I see occurring this week. And yeah, I'd love to know more about what that's been like to be surrounded in this sort of an environment with other veterans. Yeah, firstly, I think it, I mean, I admire every one of those guys because I don't think, you know, at the end of the day, this comes down to the individual, whether they can, they're open to the concept of engaging in this sort of, this medicine. Um, so I, I and certainly, can, I think it's a bit of a, you know, for military guys, I think it, that's a hard bridge to, to cross, you know, um, because it kind of contradicts a lot of everything we're kind of programmed. So I just admire everyone, every one of them for, for being a part of this and, and all the way through the journey, you know, it's always sort of a little, a little anxious about who these people were going to be. Um, because although people do think they're sort of a, there's, you know, a, a veteran is, you know, a, a sort of standard sort of person. That's not the case. You know, each one of those people up there, I see the human behind the veteran. Mm. And um, I think it's just been amazing because, you know, we. It's, it's also been important for me, this course, this group, I'm so glad it's not all veterans. 
but the thing is the great thing about the veterans which sometimes you'd maybe and maybe you guys thought this could happen is we would sort of there would be the veterans and there would be the the other part of the group you know but they're not you know the the guys are just we're just all one mm. we're just all one and it's 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 so powerful to know that you know these guys are humble they're not you know there's there's no one with massive egos that you know which you usually get a lot in the military um so just to hold down that and being here with with you know my buddy from back home and knowing his story is just really powerful it's, it's just amazing the level of depth in the sharing was palpable i mean i even spoke with the facilitators afterward and i myself was crying during during the sharing because it was just I felt like I was experiencing the emotion, emotions in that room that came from life experiences that I would never get to have. So to hear somebody speak that I had actually been sitting next to in ceremony the night before say something like very casually mentioned, yeah, I've, I've probably killed the most people in the in Canada, the country that I came from, you know, um, and and like sitting with the weight of, of a, a statement like that, um, it, it opened up a new level of empathy in me for for what's really happening and um, what are what our veterans, you know, really anybody who's in any line of service, you know, police, doctors, nurses, the amount of space you have to hold f when it comes to emergencies. Um, it's, I mean, I have profound, profound respect for that. And going back to your story, mm. you really had kind of a, well, I don't want to project here, but it sounded like a life turning point with your story about the chimp and how you've been able to see that in a, in a brand new way. Is that right? Yeah, correct. I mean, my intention, you know, I have a fair few intentions, but although in the last few years, you know, I was a very different person uh, back in 2014 and prior. Um, and it, you know, it's always been continuous improvement every, every day. Um, but you know, I gave up drinking, which was, amazing for me to be at the power of doing that has changed so much in my life um so i've already done a lot of work a lot of work and i'm, I'm back you know I've, I've created more in the last five years than i have in my life um so for me my intention but however although i have got that stability now i still feel that that disrupt button is close and i do feel that you know if something happened quite drastic as, as things do you know people die in life and etc cetera, etc cetera. if something like that happened i feel i could that would be my escape and that scares me so for me my intention was to to be able to um get rid of that um uh destructive mechanism within me i wanted to get rid of that and i also mentioned to the shaman that you know i felt like i you know, I had to revisit the chimp. I have to get, tell you another story now before this, which is, is quite, it, it, this just blew me away. And, it, but again, anyway, let me tell you the story, but, um, you know, I, I from that experience as a kid, 10 years old, I locked that away and it didn't really, you know, that was it. It was gone, locked away in a box, you know, forgotten, never really appreciating the damage that it had done. Um, in 2011, I was overseas here, there and everywhere, you know, just my, my life was still mayhem, although I was doing some great things. And a friend of mine that I joined the Royal Marines when I was 18, uh, with a guy called Troy, um, he, I said, look, I'm going back to the UK. I was going to go back there, see my son. And he said, oh, mate, let's meet up. He said, I've, I've got something to tell you. And I went, okay, tell me. And he said, no, 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 I'll wait to see you. And I thought, oh, shit, what have I done? And um, 
I got back to the UK, met him in the bar, and uh, he says, oh, it's great to see you, but I've not seen him for ages. Uh, we gave him a big hug, and he says, mate, he says, I've, I've got a story for you. I said, what? He said, I've just come back from Afghan. Uh, I was not long back from Afghan. He was not long back from Afghan. He was a colour sergeant, so that meant he was he was in charge of a, quite a, a, a large group of, of guys. Um, and he was basically struggling over there to get equipment for his guys to carry out operations. And that was the vehicles. Um, so he said that he was sending emails to the military transport officer, you know, sending emails all the time and getting back, you know, you're not getting the vehicle, vehicles. It's protocol ac across the region. We just haven't got them. I'm telling the same to everyone. This is not just because of you. Um, and he said to me, he says, you know me, Ollie. He says, I don't take no for an answer. So I went to Camp Bastion to go and see him. And he said, I walked in there. He said, I got past the RMPs and managed to get in his office. And um, he said, who are you? And I, I said, look, I'm Sergeant Robson. I've been sending you the emails. And he said, what are you doing in here? He said, if you don't leave, I'm going to call the RMPs. You'll be arrested. Go. And he starts trying to argue. He says, go. Otherwise, it's going to happen. And anyway, he's, he's um, starting to walk out of the office, you know, tail between his legs. And um, suddenly he says, before you go, he says, do you know a guy called Ollie Ollerton? And Troy stops in his tracks and he turns around and he says, do I know Ollie? You know, with a question mark, um, sort of smiling. And um, he says, yeah, he says, I, I can't believe you asked. And he said, I joined the Royal Marines with, with Ollie. Now, the Royal Marines are quite a small group. The military in the UK is very small. So this guy probably asked every Marine that he had bumped into. Um, but this day he'd struck lucky. And he said, yeah, yeah, I joined up with, with Ollie. We went to Northern Ireland, went to Operation Desert Storm together. Then shortly after that, he joined the Special Forces. And I never really saw him a lot after that. And um, But we still kept in touch. But yeah, he's my best mate. And he's, he's sort of... Um, and he says to, the, to, to this officer, he says, he said, why, why are you asking? How do you know Ollie? And he says, you know, I've been looking for that boy all of my career. And Troy thinks, oh God, what has he done? And he says, I was with that boy when he got attacked by a chimpanzee. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so he was my brother's best mate who was with me that went to the circus that day. Wow. And Troy went, oh my God. He says, the chimp. And he's like, Ollie's told me the chimp story. He says, yeah, I was with him that day. He got, wow. he got um, savaged by a, by a chimpanzee. So he was like, oh, my God. And so they're chatting and laughing and talking about Ollie and, you know, all this stuff and having a laugh. And um, just as Troy is about to leave, he goes to shake his hand and the guy pulls him in and he says, uh, where do you want those vehicles? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> So for me... The chimp came through. Well, the chimp, <laughs> to Bridget Bardo. Wow. To 30 years later wow. in Iraq, getting the guys on 4-5 Commando, mm. those, those, those vehicles they needed. That chimp just kept on giving. Wow. But for me, that was, I've, I've studied that. Why, why did that happen? But for me at that moment, it took me back. To, it reopened the chimp for me. Mm. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it was almost like a message. You need to revisit the chimp. Mm. So that was so powerful for me. And then I also sort of thought, it also made me think that there's a much bigger picture here. You know, there's no such thing as coincidence, you know. So it, it really opened my mind to, you know, everything happens for a reason. And there's so much to this life than we are led to believe. Um, but that moment was just was just crazy. Um, and that's that really, you know, so so basically from that, you know, it's made me think a lot about the chimp, a lot, a lot about how it made me reflect on my life and how that whole attack, how could that not have an effect on a 10 year old boy and the rest of his life? And it's sort of given me a bit understanding about why, where I got this sort of crazy street, you know, all the, all the, um, all the um, sadness I caused my mom and, you know, all the people along uh, along my path through life um so for me when i went into ceremony the other night you know it was i wanted to meet the chimp and i said to the shaman i want to meet the chimp and i really in the back of my mind i thought that oh, probably won't happen um and then in ceremony i mean the first time we took the medicine i did feel 
something but obviously that you know we keep the 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 the, the dose was quite low for, for obvious reasons but it almost just came in and it just said hello it sort of tapped me and and then went and I, you know i knew it was there um so then the second ceremony we obviously took more of the medicine and um for me it was it was it was amazing it was amazing um and before i knew it i was you know in that dream state um which is unreal you know and at first you know it it wasn't you know i didn't have any massive sort of visions or anything it um first of all i just thought and this is sort of personal to me but i always reflect things on a sort of on a bigger perspective but i kind of saw that obviously i'm i i'm a celebrity i hate saying that word but you know that we I've created this person I'm supposed to be. People expect that of me. You know, this hard former SAS soldier, blah, 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 you know, that's on TV. And the thing is, their, expectation, their, their expectations of me are not me. But the thing is, and I feel that's what many of us do. We build this person we're supposed to be, and it's not us, but we put so much energy into that being this person we're supposed to be that we neglect ourselves and we become the byproduct of that you know and that that sort of person we're supposed to be is emotionless you know the person that is emotion is you you know and that's the person that you know is the is the is the misery sometimes behind the smile and etc etc that's the real person and i feel that it just made me look at that in a different way and think how irrelevant all that is and you have to you know it's not to say you can't have that but you should not um, you should not neglect yourself in the process. That has to be the byproduct, not you, if it's going to be that. So it really sort of, it was a lot of reflections and observations going along that way. And, you know, I got to the point, you know, then the shaman came around and they sang and, and that was amazing. Um, and then I felt in me, there was, I wanted to go deeper. I just felt I needed to go deeper. So I asked for some more medicine, uh, which I was given and and then I went to the next level, to the next level, <laughs> which was amazing. It was really amazing. I could, the power of that was just, yeah, it's, it was like nothing I've ever felt before. But, you know, and I started going back to that 10-year-old boy. And I was starting to look, you know, I was really starting to be that 10-year-old boy again. And then I started to think about, I, I do a lot of talks about, you know, it's, I've done books and talks and a, a lot of the stories about the chimp. You know, and it, it made me think, it's all about me, 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 me. And it's all me, me, it's all me. And then all of a sudden it was almost like a tap on the shoulder and it went, hey, what about the chimp? And it made me think straight away, wow, I've never, ever thought about how this was for the chimp so straight at that point and it was a bizarre experience i i i was sat sort of cross-legged with my arm out to the side and my knuckle you know sort of down on on the mat and it was a bizarre i kind of looked to my left arm and then i went oh my god oh my god <laughs> and i kind of touched my nose and my ears which look a bit monkeyish anyway <laughs> And then I sort of scrubbed my hair, you know, just not, not without thinking about it. And I thought, oh, my God, you, you are the chimp. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just and, and and although I was like I was fighting that, I was fighting that. It wanted me to, to be the sort of chimp and take it from the chimp's perspective. Mm. And I was fighting it. And that was the struggle for me. It was like, just let it go. Allow it to happen. Instead of going, wow, this is bizarre. You know, you shouldn't go. This is this is crazy. Mm. It was all about you know let go let go surrender to it surrender to it and before i knew it i i honestly was the chimp you know and i i can remember i sort of i was in the scenario i was there i was i could feel myself it was a hot day i got up i was sleepy you know and i shook all the leaves off my back that were on because i'd just been lying down of course and mm -hmm. um you know as i looked up i saw me and i saw me stood above my baby the 10 year old version of you the 10 year old version of me yeah so you're you're looking at the 10 year old version of you through the eyes of this champ yeah wow yeah and i could see him behind me there was the big top and the door had come through and there to me was the chimp and the enemy which was me mm. behind and it wasn't really about i didn't go into the attack i went through what was going through 
that chimp's mind, mm. you know, how it looked at me and that situation. And that was the fact that, you know, our basic human drive is our evolution of the species. Regardless of how you want to, you know, frame it, that's what drives us. And that to me, I saw straight through the eyes. It was almost like a computer screen. It mm. was like going threat, mm. you know, threat to my my species, threat to my baby and danger, danger. It was like, and I was rearing up for battle, you know, in, in a split second, you know, before I knew it, I was on the mat and I had both fists in the floor, you know, and I, I was making noises. <laughs> so you were, you were having like this full on physiological response to being, being the, chimp the chimp whose baby was threatened. Yeah. Like, yeah. did you feel like your adrenaline was going and yeah, your heart? Yeah, no, absolutely. Wow. I, I was preparing for war. Wow. You know, and that, I actually let out that roar that I heard. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> afterwards people said, well, we heard, you know, the guy that sat next to me said, you were, I couldn't figure out, but you were some kind of animal. And mm. then obviously when we shared afterwards, he went, man, that's when you were the chimp. You know, I let that <laughs> roar out. And that was the roar that I heard, which caught my attention. Wow. And... I didn't really go a lot further to that, but all I was thinking in my head, I was the chimp and I was going, I'm going to come and kill you. I'm going to make you stop. I'm going to stop you from breathing until I can get my baby and, and get it to safety. And that mm. was going through my head. And then it made me really respect that chimp about, you know, and that female chimp, that it was this selfless protector. Mm. You know, it would do anything to, to stop me threatening the life of its baby, of its species. Um, and from that moment on, you know, I, I could have easily then gone into the whole attack, but that for me at that point didn't seem a value. Mm. Uh, I don't know if I just didn't want to go down that path because it was probably a little bit too traumatic. But what I did do, it, it then helped me reflect straight away. I was able to look at every situation, every bit of trauma in my life and take it on a biggest perspective, not as the victim. Mm. Because when we've got this victim mentality, we feel very subjective or subjected. And it helped me look at the thing, look at this situation as a whole and appreciate and understand everything about that situation. Mm. But then it went, you know, and then I then reflected on, you know, the, 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 the attack I talked about, you know, on the highway that was the epiphany for me. I, put, I was sat in the driving seat of the other car, you know, and I was looking through the eyes of the the the, the young um, militia um, man on the on the other end of my um, my weapon, my gun, you know. And I was looking through the, I was looking up, and I was only a young boy, and I was looking through the window, and then you know, I just thought these guys were civilians in this car, and then all of a sudden, my weapon comes up and smashes the rounds through the first windows. And that was kind of hard because I've always, I've always thought about that that situation and whether he survived or not. And I truly believe that whatever happened, you know, I, I do believe he survived. I, I don't know. I've just got that feeling that he did. But then that whole thing, then you know, it then made me, you know, my girlfriend who um, is absolutely amazing. She works with me. You know, she's been so supportive of me. It really helped me appreciate who she was. You know, this is a woman that you know, he's suffers with some insecurities and, um, you know, she was prepared to let me come on this trip on my own because she knew the value, you know, she's prepared to let me go to Costa Rica to do something she knows nothing about with a group of people she doesn't know, but she's prepared to do that. You know, that selfless love, you know, and it made me reflect on that about how she is with our business and everything else. You know, Laura, she works so hard and I'm, you know, I'm such a, you know, I'm, I'm onto her all the time. You know, have you done this? Have you done that? Da, da, da. And she's got a young boy, you know, he's 10 years old, which is quite amazing because I look at him 10 years old and think, Jesus, that was the same age as me when I got hit by, you know, attacked by the chimp. But it made me really respect her and have so much more compassion for her because regardless, just like the chimp, her priority is William, not me. I am a priority, but it doesn't become before William. And it really made me appreciate everything she has to do before even, you know, and meeting a deadline doesn't matter. You know, what matters is her, her protecting her son and making sure he has the best upbringing he can have. And then work comes second after that. And it really helped me empathize 
and I feel so much compassion for for how hard she works, you know. And she's the one. With, I, I am. I, I don't have that burden as such. I mean, she's the one that looks and cares for him. We we all live together. But yeah, you know, it really, really, you know, and that really made me feel so much compassion. And then I think the whole thing with that experience was compassion. You know, so much compassion and understanding for for other people. Um, so it's profound for me profound and there was you know there's a lot of so many things but so many observations you know that the visual was the monkey you know the visual was was um again sitting in that car um but the there was so many other messages in there you know like my company breakpoint i came up with the concept of breakpoint you know people told me i shouldn't change i shouldn't have that name because i'm from the you know, I'm ex special forces break point. It sounds like you're breaking people when it's quite the opposite. You know, I just knew the concept of break point really felt what I'd gone through in that session. You know, and it's, it's, it's the, it's what we all have to go through. We have to go through that short term discomfort for the long term gain. And so many people turn back at the last minute of success, you know, of that breakthrough to the development and growth they're not prepared to cross that bridge, but that is the point of, of absolute growth. Mm. So, you know, just so many confirmed messages about I was on the right path and it was, it was, it was amazing. Amazing. I'm so excited about tonight. Wow. Yeah. Going yeah. back in for more. <laughs> yeah. I love this idea and I love what I'm hearing from you and what I'm, I'm learning myself about this whole process of working with the medicine, it's been something that's been on my mind a lot actually about <clears throat> fear and resistance and meeting that break point. And there's a mentality out there. It's like, well, push through your fear and like bust through it and just like punch it in the face and say no to it. But I was like, well, I've been like, oh, I kind of had this all wrong. It's not about push away your fear. Mm. It's about open to it. Yeah. Let it permeate you. Let yeah. yourself feel it. And it's heavy sometimes. But on the other side of that, like that's where the treasure is. Mm. That's where the treasure is. Yeah. Yeah. And you and I were talking before, because I mean, you, you've spoken a lot you've written a book uh, you're writing another book but we were talking about stories and the way I guess the perception the perception the spin we put on our stories that victim mentality or making ourselves a hero how that literally writes our reality and Working with the medicine here, but then befriending um, Scott, who's the director here, we had a conversation this summer about my writings because I shared with you I've been journaling since I was eight years mm. old, writing every single thing that's happened to me, detailing every trauma with the juicy drippings of exactly how it occurred and how much darkness I felt. And Scott pointed something out to me. He said, you know, you want to be careful with the written word because it's kind of like a contract you're putting out into the universe. And you're basically saying, I want more of this. And that's that law of attraction, that power of intention that you're speaking about here. So since that moment for me, I've been journaling differently. And it's not that I'm turning a blind eye to what's difficult. It's that I'm choosing my own adventure. And when hard stuff happens, I get to decide the lens, the perception, and how I experience that event. I think that's so powerful. And, and, you know, I questioned very much the same thing the other night. You know, I talk about those events. And I see a lot of people, I think a lot of the veterans that have come here, I think if there's, if you're stuck in that moment, if you're reliving that moment, by talking about the trauma of the event, you will get more of what you, you know, exactly as you've just stated, you get more of that. And I was really conscious of that. You know, I'm telling this story all the time. You know, I'm telling the story about the attack. I'm telling this because they're what people want to hear. People want, don't want the good news. You know, they want to, they want to hear the traumatic event. Mm -hmm. And I feel so many veterans are caught in that cycle of reliving the moment. 
And I call it really for that. I mean, for me, I, I've, I've, since that first session, that second session, I've really thought about that a lot. And I thought, am I doing the right thing by talking about the monkey? Am I doing the right thing about talking about the attack? And I feel now that I am because the way I've put a spin on that is I've taken the positive from it, you know, with, with the chimp. And especially after the other night, I really have taken a, a positive spin on that. Um, and the, the situation in Baghdad, which was an absolute epiphany for me, you know, the, the power of visualization, et cetera, et cetera, although it came from quite a horrific event, was amazing. But, you know, when it comes to a lot of, you know, the buzzword is mental health. And I feel that so many, when it comes to veterans, and I don't think it's just, it's not just owned by veterans, but people are reliving that. They're stuck in that cycle of talking about the traumatic event, talking to talk, but we have to start dealing with mental wealth. What are you doing to pull yourself away from that and start looking at it in a positive light and start doing things that are creating wealth, mental wealth? Mm. You know, and that, that for me, that is meditation and that is mindfulness. You know, mindfulness to me, people get freaked out about that. You can't, surely you're in the special forces, you can't meditate and all that. It's, you know, that's, that's for hippies. You know, but for me, you know, meditation for me is my focused attention at an intention. And for mm. me, it's stripping away everything that doesn't matter and focusing on the one to two things that do every day I do meditation. Now, we have 70,000 thoughts thereabouts going around our heads every day. Now, unless you find one or two things you want to align with, you'll be given things to align with and you will end up with things that you really don't want. But unless you choose, you know, I, I've, I've read, I'm reading a, a good book at the moment. I can't even remember the name of it, but it's Cybernetics. Have you heard of that book? And it's basically saying that the subconscious is a goal, um, a goal driving mechanism. So it doesn't matter. It will drive towards whatever you think about. You know, so if you are thinking about negative things, it will drive you towards them. You know, and that is our basic, that's our survival blueprint. You know, that is, it's so obvious when you look at it. I look so much at evolution as to where we are today, you know, and, I, I talk about this a lot and I feel that, you know, people wonder why they feel fear. We talked about fear this morning in the session. You know, people wonder why they, you know, whenever they go to do something, they're, you know, they're, they're within the honeymoon period, they're over it. But, you know, we are, when it comes to human evolution, our minds want us to keep on doing what we did yesterday and the day before and the day before that, because as far as it's concerned, it's kept us alive till today. It does not care if you're happy or sad or whether it's a good or bad experience. It just knows that that's kept us alive till today. So when we want to do something new, we go, no, no, no. What is that? You know, it's, it's scared to venture into that because you haven't done it before. You know, so that's why you feel the fear. But once you start to understand that is just part of our humanness, it really helps you to evolve. And you then go, look, I know I'm, I'm, a, I'm going to get some fear here. I accept that fear. I appreciate it. I understand why you're doing it, but you're not, well, you're not needed at this point. You move it to the side and you move through it. And I also think that people really need to have a goal because that goal becomes their focus. And then mm. if they have a goal that's big enough, if you don't have a goal, when something happens, you become a victim of that circumstance. But if you have a goal that's driving you, you that becomes bigger than the circumstance. Mm. But if you don't have any, any kind of goal, you get lost in that world of being that victim. Mm. You know, but when the per, when your purpose and purpose is a massive topic as well, you know, understanding your purpose. When you actually understand your purpose and that's driven by goals, you know, these things, these small things that happen just become part of the journey. And you accept and appreciate them instead of getting hooked up on them. Mm. You know, and it's, it's yeah, I, I study a lot, you know, I look at evolution, we, you know, evolution of the species. Um, and I think it's helped me to understand how we work. Mm. This idea of the 70,000 thoughts roughly a day, I've actually talked about this before on this mm. podcast and this idea that I think it's like 98% of those 70,000 thoughts are repeated. We are yeah. such creatures of habit. And then not many people know this because I've actually never shared this story on the podcast, but the name of the thought room came from my first experiences here at Soltara in the medicine space. And I entered what I would call like a cosmic sandbox 
of blackness. And I was just kind of sitting there in this void waiting for something to happen. And the first thing that happened was I had a thought, like a light bulb, or I sometimes describe it like a, a drop of food coloring that, you know, just goes out in, in water. So the thought dripped down into this cosmic sandbox and started to create this essence that I could see. You know, that's not an experience we get to have a lot is where we see or feel the embodiment of a thought. So I had a thought. I think it was a positive thought. I was going, oh, wow, this, this, is, this is such a cool experience. I'm, I'm in this space. I'm, you know, and it was like this warmth and this pulsing color and vibration. And it was like being in a Crayola Lego world. And then I had another thought and I was like, oh, actually, I'm a little afraid of this. Like, this is a lot to handle right now, or I feel really lonely. And, you know, the the room that I was in, um, the colors around me became monochromatic and really dull, and I suddenly felt cold, and I didn't like how I was feeling, and I had to sit with how I was feeling. And suddenly, it was like, Eureka, this, I'm controlling this. I can just choose the thought and then I get to feel good or not. If I'm not conscious of it, it's going to go. Like you said, it's, Mm. it's the river that flows to the ocean. So that felt immense. And it felt like a huge responsibility now to be vigilant about what I was creating in my life. Because I personally had become so addicted to my story of suffering and all that I had survived in my life and the dramatic custody battle over us as kids and the divorce and the abuse, uh, sexual abuse, you know, growing all of this. And it was just like, I wanted to stay in that because it was what I knew. And um, so leaving Soltara that first time I had written down in my journal use this tool of the thought rooms. When you think a thought, does it feel good to be inside that room created by that thought? And I left myself a question, how do you want to feel? And I wrote that on a piece of paper and I keep it on my desk still in my office. How do I want to feel? It's right there in front of my face. And if I'm agitated or frustrated or feeling unproductive instead of being like oh I'm, I'm unproductive today I suck I'm the worst I'll go oh, okay there's a discrepancy between what I'm feeling and how I want to feel so I need to now funnel that energy into embodying visualizing feeling how I want to feel consciously wow yeah <laughs> phenomenal yeah but it's you know it's I, I also read some well, what you've done there what I see is you know you you've you've come up with the idea and what a problem a lot well majority of us have we we try and resolve the the problem we try and we try and force it through using the frontal cortex and that's not where that's where the ideas are created and then you should leave time for the subconscious then to absorb that mm-hmm. and then it will deliver. Mm. But you know, again, this this book, which is amazing, I'm reading at the moment, is is you know, it states that you know, even before you go to bed, you set the intention of what you want. You know, even mm. if it's in your sleep, of what you want to achieve, what you want to do, and don't try and solve that or find the answer straight away. You just ask for it, mm-hmm. and it will be delivered. Mm-hmm. But when we try and solve problems and 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 tr- and try and come up with answers, and we try mm. and force it. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work that way. It has to sink in first and then it gets absorbed and then it delivers at some point. Because there's a, I think what I'm hearing too is this, when we become attached to the how mm. the uh, of the outcome, it's like, yeah. well, it's got to follow this course. I've got to take yeah. a left turn, then a right turn. No, it's like, I, I would like to be over there at point B. I'm at point A. That's it. There's, yeah. there's nothing else. Yeah, exactly. Let the universe be yeah. the map. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I think, you know, some people are looking for some kind of logic in that theory. Mm. And, you know, if I can plant any kind of logic to say anything about that, it's like once you've planted that, you know, you've created the visualization, which is the power behind the drive. Mm-hmm. 
once you once you've created that vision you leave it to do its work and it's it's as simple as you may take a left turn whereas you'd have taken a right turn you might say yes to a meeting with someone who before you made that positive intent you might not have bothered the opportunities line up once you once you create the intention it's it's really is i think there are a lot of the problem a lot i think a lot of the pro- problem with people is it sounds too simple to be true mm. It sounds too what well, I can think about. Oh, why can't I? I, I think about being a millionaire all the time. Mm-hmm. But you know, there are people have got it so wrong because yeah, you can't just think of a million pounds. What there's no emotion in a million pounds. Mm-hmm. There's emotion in what you could do with a million pounds. Mm-hmm. But you know, people people just don't understand how it works, and it has to be so sort of deep seated and not forced. Mm-hmm. But you have to set the positive intention, leave it there, create the visualization of where you want to be. And I think also a date is really important when you do mm. visualize and set goals because as far as the universe is concerned, a million years doesn't mean anything. Right, yeah. Yeah, this is interesting too, like the idea of, okay, I want a million dollars, I want a million pounds. And people say, I've been saying that forever. I've been saying I, I want to win the lottery, but it's, there's... Um, they're focused a, on the lack of it. They're focused on the lack of it. They're they're focused on how what they don't have now yeah. and the feeling of like, ugh, yeah. I don't have this. Um, so, I mean, I would I would explain it as as vibration. Some people might think that's a little bit too woo woo, but you could say embodiment. If that doesn't make sense to you, I would say it's about trying to feel as if you already have it and it's re- that's it's that's not an easy thing to do i mean we're we're talking of it lightly here because it sounds like you've had some practice and you've mm. seen how it can work and i feel the same um but that's really what it is it's about being vigilant with yourself okay i'm saying i want this thing but am i really feeling about it that it's like yeah. oh it's never coming like i want this this lover this partner but it's like where are they mm. they're not here i'm really lonely i'm you know like watch what your subconscious is saying about the thing that you're trying to create mm. not oh i know they're out there somewhere i just have to keep working on myself i have to trust this is hard to trust it feels hard to trust but i'm going to keep trusting yeah yeah i think it's yeah absolutely and you know people have to realize that you words have to create thoughts and thoughts create feelings Mm -hmm. you know if you're if if it's just words with no feeling and emotion you just won't you know you'll just end up with you'll you'll be stuck with the same problem Mm. um and you know i I meet people every day you know they're, they're stuck in that monotone drone of oh it would be me it always happens to me and it's just such a it's such a negative that and then they can't understand why they're just getting more of what they're what they what they don't want mm. because what they don't want is always on their mind mm-hmm. but the thing is why don't you put what you do want as always being on your mind and you will get that mm-hmm. no, it's just a simple so a simple equation it is simple once the car gets rolling yeah. because when you start getting the momentum in the positive direction and you start saying oh i just said the other day I wanted a new job and now that friend over there just told me about this opportunity at their company. Oh my gosh, now I'm, I'm excited to stay up all night and redo my resume or maybe there's some other jobs or, you know, once you get a taste of that and a taste of that feeling, it, it mm. kind of feeds itself, but yeah. it's when you're really stuck that, you know, you need to take a hard look inside and, and really say, what am I perpetuating here? Yeah, And it's ugly sometimes. Yeah. No, absolutely. And it's, um, you know, people are so, stu- you know, like I said before, people go, oh, that's weird. <laughs> as soon as something profound happens, <laughs> oh, what a coincidence. Mm. But, you know, when they've got to understand when things happen like that, that's the time you really need to think about what's just happened. Mm. You know, what has, you know, really, really live with that moment about what's happened. Not just go, they just smash it straight out, of the, you know, straight out of their mind and go, oh, that was, that was weird. Mm-hmm. That was a coincidence. And they forget about it and it's gone. Mm-hmm. But they need to, you know, you that you need to, you need to embrace that moment and really think about the the the, the magic of that moment of what's mm. just happened. You know, it's like these days I, you know, regardless of who I meet, who I bump into, I analyze why have I just bumped? You know, it could be just a passing hello, but I analyze why have I, you know, is there more to be investigated with that? Mm. And that has changed, you know, that's that's brought me some massive opportunities just doing that, you know, analyzing every moment. And, you know, people for me, if, you know, it's, people can have their own opinions, and I've got no, 
I'm not going to earn anything from telling someone that the power of positive thought and visualization works. But, you know, all I can say is that it nearly got me killed. Mm. And people that say that it doesn't work, they're losing out. Mm. They're losing out. Um, so, I, I, you know, I just think, you know, it, it would be all this stuff kids learn in school. It's such a, you know, if if they spent some time on this. Mm. It would, it would actually create a society that society don't want <laughs> creative, powerful individuals. Mm. But, um, yeah, so, you know, it's, it's just such a gift to be able to, to have that power of thought and, and, and see that once you see it work once, it's addictive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. In the best way. Yeah. So before we go here, um, one, I would love for you to tell us how people can find you, what you're currently working on, um, the name of your first book so people can find it, and anything else you want to share about what you're doing right now. Okay, so I've, my company is called Breakpoint, um, and you can find that. It's break-point.co.uk or .com. Uh, you can find it on Instagram, on um, obviously on the internet. You can find it on Instagram. You can find it on Twitter, all social media channels. Um, the work we do is basically we we show people that they can push beyond their limitations. We we break the blueprint. Uh, we have some online courses and things, mindset programs, etc. I'm working on an amazing project at the moment. I'm so proud of. It's taken two years to come to fruition, but that's basically called the Academy Breakpoint Academy, and that is. Um, being a transition partner for veterans. So veterans that have served our country, um, obviously. Um, we provide a three-day course um, for veterans, which we, we they go through drugs and alcohol testing. They go through uh, psychometric testing based on neuroscience. Um, and then we put them through a couple of days training, which is basically mindset. And it's all, you know, about power of positive thought, et cetera, et cetera. Um, a couple of exercises to make sure that they um, can handle pressure. There's no ongoing issues from being in the military. And then we've got jobs for them and with good career paths. So we've linked up with another company that have got, um, you know, hundreds of jobs for veterans. So we're really excited to launch that, which is going to launch in uh, January, 2020. So really, really, you know, that really is something that's really means a lot to me. So that's Breakpoint. Um, we've also got another, oh, sorry, the book. The book is called Breakpoint. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you can find the book on Amazon. It's done particularly well. And the book isn't about the military. The military was part of um, was part of my journey. But, you know, that book starts at 10, year, 10 years old when I was attacked by the chimp and it leads to the present day. And it's, you know, a lot of the stuff I've talked about, but the underlying theme is the power of positivity and, and intent, visualization, et cetera, et cetera. My new book coming out is called Battle Ready. And that's basically a self-help book for people who want to improve their lives to a more productive, more positive life. And it's the process that I went through when I was, when I was broken um, and how I fixed myself, you know, I self-helped my way all, all the way through that journey, which was probably not the best of things at time. You know, I, I should have looked for help, which as men tend not to do. But yeah, it's the process that I went through. So I'm very excited about that. That's launched in April 2020. Uh, um, and I think that's about it, isn't it? Is I think so. <laughs> that sounds great. Ollie, thank you so, oh, thank you so much, much for you. sitting down with me today. These were fantastic stories, and I can feel that this is going to be um, far-reaching. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks again.